Up next, the godfather of alternative rock tells us the very personal story of one of the true standards of 1988. We solve the mystery of this very eerie and brilliant song, plus he goes in depth of uh, how he created the band's seminal album cover, a bona fide must-see story behind the song, next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Man, we have a great show today. Now right here, I, I normally share a memory that we as kids of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s have in common, you know, to invite other like-minded music fans to subscribe to this channel. Going forward, I wanna share one of your memories. So just share that in the comments below and we'll pick one and use it every day. We'll do a shout out as well. An example in the past would be like when I say, uh, if you've ever tried to curate the, the perfect mixtape for your crush, and you are gonna love this channel. Subscribe below right now so you never miss an episode of the history of the great artists and songs of the classic era. So again, that's how, it's, uh, how I've done it in the past. Share a cool memory like that in the comments and we may just use it. Also, if you wanna go deeper into the history of rock and pop, check us out on Patreon where we have a lot more content there. Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction. Just one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done. And I'm coming up on 600 interviews, actually. I may actually have passed that already. Uh, been quite a few. Perry Farrell is just one of those unique talents. He is the godfather of alternative rock. You know, the kind of music that was created by him were for the outcasts and, and the strange ones, like me, like you. I mean, he started Lollapalooza, the live event of my generation, Generation X. He's created so many songs that have been really the supreme soundtrack of my coming of age years, probably yours as well. And today we're presenting the story of arguably their greatest composition and the one that put them on the map. My favorite ever by them, Jane says, from their essential 1988 LP, Nothing Shocking. Jane Fortunately, due to YouTube policy, we have to blur the part of the controversial cover, but it's a brilliant cover that Perry actually created with paper mache and he tells that story in our interview, very interesting. You know, I always love it when a song has a mystery to solve. You know, when I first heard this song so many years ago, I was extremely curious about who Jane was. Then I heard the urban legend that the band was also named after the same Jane. And Perry tells us about the real Jane, how she inspired the song. It's a really great story, very sad, very compelling, masterfully told by its unique lyricist. As we go into this interview with Perry Farrell, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. They support our mission of keeping the music alive. Speaking of unique, uh, Zenny frames. I wear them all the time. They're a true alternative choice with their variety of colors, and shapes, and styles. They add a cool look to those who wear them, I tell you. Go to zenny.com today. Design your own pair. Here is the great Perry Farrell with the story. Jane says that really helped people identify the human side of addiction. And then also the way that you lyrically talked about that, you could tell you had a, a true love for her as a, as a human being. Well, yeah, you know, she tell was- Tell us about uh, Jane Okay, says. so Jane Painter came from, I think Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. And she was uh, actually a, a very clever, young lady. She went to a college, an all-girls college, um, all-girls college, and she had, had a knack for, for writing. She enjoyed literature. Um, you know, she turned me on to the art of drinking wine in the afternoon with cheese and crackers. Like, she was <laughs> kind of sophisticated, yeah. except she had this wild side to her. She mm -hmm. was running away from mom and dad, you know, out to, to California. Uh, what she was looking for, uh, I don't know, but she ended up to uh, that that place on on Wilton housed at least you know twelve people at a time. The way I got it to tell you that story that you' be waiting to hear, I had no other way to get this. So forgive me um, for what I'm about to tell you, but I pretended to be a gay interior decorator. Because the guy, when he saw me, I had long dreadlocks. I didn't think there was any way I was gonna get a house. 
other than to say, you know, I'm just a flamboyant gay guy who loves to, and, and I'll be good to your house, but I'll interior decorate the place and it'll be great. No harm. They had no idea that I was actually a, a wild, you know, rock, rock and roll star. kid. Right, you know? right. Uh, and there was going to be intense parties, you know, and, and a re rehearsal studio in the back there that the cops would come every three days. To, to shut us down. And Jane lived there too. Well, Jane lived yeah. there too. Um, she was a friend of Eric's. So what would happen is like w once a month or once every few months, somebody would crash and burn and have to go back home uh, or would, couldn't make rent. And so yeah. I was constantly like- Trying to find people. Tr constantly <laughs> trying to find people to, okay, uh, you know, Ed's gone. Ed and the Python and, and his girlfriend are gone. So we need somebody so that, you know, eventually Jane came to our lovely abode. So Jane came in and um, I got to know her and we started partying together like we all did at the Wilton house. She really was fond of uh, heroin. Um, and so she started going out with this kid. It was a little Mexican kid. Sergio. Sergio, who was, was dealing to us all. And eventually, um, I don't know what ever happened to Sergio. He kind of just disappeared. So he yeah. probably got taken off the street. Um, Jane, I lost touch with her, but um, she was fun. She was a fun girl. You know, she ended up. She used to wear the wig. Oh, yeah. About. She Tell us wear, about that. Well, she, you know, I think she just wanted to, she was, you know, really enamored with the likes of like people like Edie Sedgwick. So she, she loved the, you know, Warhol, that was, whole thing yeah. was a wig. So she had a, she had her wig and she would come out and, you know, we'd all get really high and party and have fun. And what's great about how you wrote that song is why people identify with it, I think is because we all have good intentions as human beings, right? I'm going to yeah. kick tomorrow. I'm going to kick tomorrow. Yeah. I'm going to save my money, go to Spain, but I'll start tomorrow. Yeah. You capture that so well in that. Yeah, well. She knows they all want her to go. Yeah, it was definitely captured is the right word for it. I mean, when you are under the, under the uh, sway of addiction, you uh, become very desperate and it can be a very sad life. There's also a real fun side to it, yeah. believe it or not. That's why you get addicted in the first place because it's so much fun. You don't see it coming, you know, but um, it well, ends she, up to destroy a lot of people. And it just, it destroyed uh, everybody I know that's been addicted. It's, it's gotten its paws on it, on, yeah. uh, on them and uh, really uh, thrown a, a, a wench into the, uh, Machinery. You painted her as such a hopeful person, though. She had such good intentions. I'm gonna. Well, she's yeah. always looking for something in the future, right? Yeah. Is what you've said. Yeah. Tell like me about I that. Say, well, I mean, she, she um, didn't want to be a hopeless junkie. Yeah. Nobody does. The, you know, you want to just you want to fit in with people. Um, and in those days, she was fitting in with the the underground of Los Angeles. You know, that was the days, that was the era of um, alternative music mm -hmm. and Jane's Addiction. That was our heyday. There were two big bands in LA. There you guys and Guns yeah. N' Roses. Yeah. And, and a lot the Chili of young Peppers. people don't realize and that. The Chili Peppers, yeah, yeah. That it kind of represented two different. Definitely, two feel, different camps, two very different camps. They were going, they were, they were maintaining the, you know, that, that hair metal ethic. But I will give them credit, they partied very hard. Slash has always talked very highly of yeah. Jane's addiction, saying yeah. what an influence and what, how great yeah. they were. Oh, that's but you great. guys were so distinct and different yeah, we in, were. in the way that you approach things. But, yeah, we were. I mean, that, we were. I, I want to ask you about the Roxy when well, you recorded your album there. Okay. The Jack Nicholson story. Well, yeah, you know, it was <laughs> ironic. Right. The irony is, you know, Jack Nicholson is so a Los Angeles and he really, uh, and, and as far as like a partier, Jack Nicholson is notorious. I yeah. mean, he is, 
Amazing how this met the man's stamina. Anyway, there's a place over the Roxy where he would party and, and you know, Zeppelin and all these guys partied there, you know, some, some notorious after parties. So the night that uh, we were going to play it at uh, the Roxy, where and we record recorded your, our very first your album, debut album. Back in those days, I always say back in those days, because <laughs> it's changed. Everything yeah. has changed so much. Right. We would make flyers and then we would go out onto the street and hand them out. So we were serving double duties. We were marketing ourselves and then performing at night. Um, Jack Nicholson was heading up, up the stairs to after the Roxy. And I gave him one of my flyers. And I said, man, come to our show. We're performing here. And he went, whoa. You came running up, yeah, right? And you had your, your corset on yeah, and <laughs> yeah. everything going there. Yeah, and he went, whoa. I scared him a little bit. <laughs> but he was cool. He took it and he said, thanks, man, thanks. And he like hightailed up the stairs. <laughs> you guys were going to be called the James Heroin Experience, right? You were yeah. playing around. Tell us a little well, bit about that. Uh, we were laying around, you know, trying to come up with names. My uh, my girlfriend at the time, Casey Nicoli, and um, you know, we were really getting into heroin, and uh, she thought to call. You know, she we were just going back and forth. Let's call it this. Let's call it that. And she said, "Jane's heroin experience." I didn't think that would. I thought, you know what? It, it doesn't have to be that obvious. It can still be Jane's heroin experience, but it can be Jane's addiction. Yeah. And that would open it up to the world because an addiction can be, you know, I'm addicted to, uh, you know, painting my fingernails, right, and toenails, right. or it could be heroin. So we had a good laugh over Jane's addiction. And I thought, you know, it's, it's, a, good one to, it's a good one to start. I want to ask you real quick about this album. Take us through, especially the cover, because this is one of the great all-time covers. It's what got me, got it taken away from, from me by my parents. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this real quick. Okay. Well, you know, I, I want to start with the, um, the chairs themselves, because that Wilton house, we lived off of uh, Melrose by about a block or so, was the cross street. But it was the part of Melrose where there's, there's no cool hip stores at all. There happened to be a chair making, like a wood chair furniture store that, uh, you know, was, was a Mexican owned Mexican uh, furniture store. Um, custom design. So in the dream that I had, I had two women with their hair on fire sitting on a, almost like a, a rocking chair. The rocking chair was kind of going this way. But the more I thought about it when, uh, when I, you know how dreams are, they don't quite make sense sometimes. Yeah. So when I came to, I thought, well, the rocking chair going this way wouldn't be quite as cool or bizarre as if it went this way. So I, had, um, I went up to the store, the, uh, the uh, wood furniture store, and told them, could you make me a rocking chair that goes this way? They didn't understand why. Of course, they didn't know anything about uh, me being a musician and it being a record cover. But they, they did what I asked. And um, the next part was the Siamese twin. Uh, this was my girlfriend at the time, Casey, Casey yeah. Nicoli. So what, um, what I did was I found a person who knew how to do pla uh, Plaster of Paris castings. Went to them and said, I had this dream about this girl with her hair on fire. She was on a slide. Uh, a swing. Um, Casey agreed to be the model, the model <laughs> which when she agreed, she had no idea what she was in for. What she was <laughs> actually in for was that took about, say, eight hours. She was 
in a plaster of Paris cast, starting with, you know, the legs, thighs, torso, and then up to, and then her face. And she was crying, I have to tell you. <laughs> crying, I'm sorry that it came to it, but I don't know, I, I guess it was worth it because this was, this was a, an icon that is, uh, I think it's gonna be a, a, a music icon no question. For as long as I'm alive, you well, know. Well, like every top 100 uh, greatest covers of all time. It's always, always in it. Always in it. Yeah. Always. Yeah. So the, the, then the last thing was, now this was, um, I was living in a storefront that I was using as an art studio. This was right around Silver Lake. Um, uh, so my bed was, where I was sleeping was literally like, maybe out here and then yeah. the the, um, the chair and the, the sculpture was there. And it was just a gray, we had a gray backdrop just to keep it real clean from behind because I wanted people to just really see the image, striking image. Um, I was the photographer. Um, I never really had done much photography, but I mean, I, I tried it many different ways. I tried shooting it in the daytime, tried shooting it at night, and through trial and error. And then the hair was uh, rubber cement. There was actually no hair. I made this beaded uh, drop that goes around her. Those beads are, they're like plastic beads to kind of give it the idea the idea of it like it might be a hat, beads falling off the end. Because I, I had made hats like that, that I'd wore actually. Yeah. Yeah. You see right those there. beads? Oh, yeah. I made this hat. Yeah. So this hat was made out of pipe cleaners. Really? Yeah, those are white pipe, white pipe cleaners with some black in there too. And then I took a brooch and put it on there. But, um, and then I took African beads and silver beads and hung them off the hat. That hat is a homemade hat. <laughs> is that cool? I love it. All right, so the rest of the beads I put over here on the sculpture. I put, and then I dunked, I just globbed plaster, of, um, not plaster of Paris, um, rubber cement on the head, which was precarious because the head started to boil up. I painted it too, you know, like um, what they call, I think it's called gauche which is a, a base of white. So it's very white paint on there. Can't tell what the color it is because it had this kind of silver finish to it. But so I'd light it up on fire, run back, take the picture. And I did that for as many times until the head, the head started to boil up over there and I wasn't able to use it anymore. So I'm lucky that I got the shot after all. And then these, these, I did the cover, you know, from start to finish, the lettering and everything else. The, um, this is in LA, I don't know if you still see them, but it used to be you could drive around and they used to have these cowhide rugs. Oh, okay. And, and it was just so reminiscent of LA to me back in the uh, late 80s, early, uh, you know, mid 80s, late 80s. It was so reminiscent of LA to me to always see these guys selling these cowskin rugs on this. They were on La Brea, see them on La Brea. So I used that to just kind of represent Los Angeles. It was just kind of a pattern that reminded me of LA. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this amazing song from 1988. Tell us uh, your memories and, and your thoughts on Jane's Addiction and this incredible album. And don't forget to leave us a memory for the intro, we may just pick yours. Now, if you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe right now so that you never miss out on our daily content, the history of music. And make sure to click on our Patreon link at the end of this so that you can see our content there. You're gonna love it. Help us keep the music alive, very important. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.